Yeah, so I'm going to talk about methods for local helioseismology. Um, here's the outline. I'll give again the, the one slide big picture to make sure that we're, we're starting from the same idea. I'll say a little bit about motivation, um, something about data for local helioseismology. There's a certain amount of overlap with the, the global helioseismology stuff. Um, so I'll go quickly through some of that. Then I'll talk about time distance helioseismology and ring diagram analysis. I'll say a little bit about linear inversions for local helioseismology, um, but basically only the case of 3D inversions. The, the one and 2D cases are pretty well covered by the, the previous lecture. And I wanted to point out that next time, the next lecture tomorrow, I'll show, we'll really be focused on results um, but I have a few results uh, sprinkled in through this lecture to, to try to not make it too dry. Um, so we'll see how it goes. So the big picture. We want to use observations at the solar surface to infer physical conditions in the interior. So for example, we're thinking about how do we measure flows underneath the surface. And I think it's worth to say a little bit about what's the difference between local helioseismology and, and global helioseismology. And the definition that I'm using here is local helioseismology is you know, the, the collective grouping that includes methods that are sensitive to the eigenfrequencies and also the eigenfunctions of the solar oscillations. And it's the sensitivity to the eigenfunctions that allows you to probe in 3D. So why do we want to measure 3D flows in the solar interior? As always with these motivation slides, it's, it's a bit of a subjective question. Um, but here, here are some ideas. One thing we can do is constrain dynamo models. So for example, we can measure the meridional flow and its time variations. Also the time variations of the differential rotation. This, this gets termed the torsional oscillations flows around active regions. These are things that matter for flux transport and therefore for the dynamo. Active region formation. So for example, we can measure flows at least near the surface during, during the early stages of active region formation. There's also the topic of global scale dynamics. For example, measurements of Rossby waves. I'll show some of that tomorrow and large scale flows. And there's, there's the interesting question of what sustains the large scale flows. Um, and it's related to the next point about testing models of convection, in particular, the statistics of convection. And I include in here the effect of rotation on convection, which I think is a, a particularly interesting topic. And Matt mentioned it a little bit already. So data. This slide is very similar to what I showed um, yesterday for global helioseismology, but bison is missing as that's sun is a star observations. And I think it's fair to say that these are the big three, HMI on the Solar Dynamics Observatory, MDI on SOHO and the Gong network of ground-based telescopes. I don't wanna go through and, and all of the details here because we did it yesterday. But you can't really give a talk about local helioseismology since the launch of SDO and not talk about SDO. So the launch was in 2010 and the instrument that's most important for helioseismology is HMI. And this instrument is producing 4K by 4K full disk images of intensity, Doppler velocity and line of sight field every 45 seconds. This is really an incredible amount of data. Um, and it also produces vector magnetic fields every 720 seconds. Um, yeah, 
So just a reminder from last time, here's a Doppler gram. And this is an image showing how each point on the solar surface is moving towards or away from the instrument. And just as a reminder, this large scale gradient you see across the image is rotation. That has an amplitude of two kilometers per second. The small, smaller features, they're easier to see off towards the limb are the horizontal motions associated with supergranules. And then you have a whole lot of P modes that have amplitudes in the range of centimeters per second, but there are many, many modes. There's also from HMI, the continuum intensity. You can also use the intensity to study P modes. Um, most local helioseismology is done with, uh, with velocity, but you can do it with intensity also. And another reason that intensity is, is useful is that it helps for understanding the context of the measurements. These little dark features, these are sunspots. I wanted to show a magnetogram also. So this is an image showing the line of sight component of the magnetic field. And magnetograms are, are really crucial for interpreting helioseismic measurements. It, it essentially doesn't make sense to do local helioseismology without knowing the magnetic context that you're working in. Um, and, and a lot of the time, the things that we're studying with local helioseismology are things that are defined by the magnetic field. For example, the sunspot, um, or at a slightly larger scale, active region, or sometimes defined by the absence of magnetic fields. For example, sometimes we want to study very quiet sun. And an additional complication here is that the acoustic waves and the surface gravity waves that are used for local helioseismology are, are quite sensitive to the presence of surface magnetic fields. So my point is that when you're doing local helioseismology, you have to know what the magnetic field looks like. And when we think about local helioseismic methods, many of them employ this procedure called tracking and remapping. And so I wanted to explain that a little bit because it's, it's, it can be confusing when you hear it in a talk for the first time. Um, so often the goal is, is you wanna study what's going on in some small patch of the sun. So you wanna study what the flows look like around a sunspot, say. And as the sun rotates, that patch of the sun rotates across the visible disk. And you wanna get rid of this effect, at least, at least at lowest order. And the solution is you, in your data analysis, you, you follow that little patch of the sun as it rotates across the disk. And you, this, this is called tracking. And then remapping is where you take the data in from the frame of either, you know, the CCD image and you remap it to some projection. So for example, a postel projection or whatever your favorite projection is, some way of remapping. Um, so just to get a little, little jargon out of the way. So hopefully it won't uh, trip you up in the future. We can take a, a closer look at a time series of topograms. I really love this movie. It's from the MDI high resolution field of view and the cadence is, is quite a bit higher than the normal MDI cadence. These are 12 seconds cadence images. And we're looking at 35 minutes of data here. And I'll, I'll play the movie. So you see a combination there of the, of the P modes and the small scale convection. If you kind of let your eyes fuzz the image out, it's a little easier to see the, to see the P modes. And it's pretty amazing that you can take something, at least pretty amazing to me, that you can take something that looks like that and make measurements from it that mean something. When you look at that field, I'll play it one more time, I like it. It just looks like noise, but there's actually a lot of information in there. 
Okay. Good. Uh, yes. Um, so I talked a little bit about observations. And in this slide, we're looking at the, the, sort of the connection between observations and science topics. And, and what goes in between there are the methods. And these are, these are data reduction methods that can be used to study all of these different science topics. And here they're, they're organized by spatial scale. So at the smaller scales, convection, um, transport of magnetic fields. Um, and then as we go a little bit bigger, some spots in active regions, flows around active regions. Um, far side active regions, I don't have a slide on far side today, um, but that's an interesting topic. And, and then all the way up to, to global scale dynamics. And there's a whole bunch of methods here and, and don't worry, I'm not gonna try to describe all of them. Um, today, I'll focus on time distance and ring diagrams and peripherally mention holography in one slide. I think. Okay, time distance here is seismology. The first paper was Tom Duval and colleagues in 92. And the idea here is that we're going to measure the time it takes waves to travel from any point on the solar surface to any other point. And the basic tool in this, in this data analysis is the cross covariance, this function C. It depends on two points on the solar surface, X1 and X2, and a time lag T. And this is how you compute it from the observations. So think of phi as your data, your data. So for example, your Doppler velocity. And so it's, it's just a cross covariance between the time series of the Doppler velocity at X1 and the time series of the Doppler velocity at X2. So what does this thing look like? This image on the left shows the cross covariance. There's a fair bit of averaging in time in here. So it's, it's smoother than what you would get in say 24 hours of data. I think it's 60 days of data if I remember right. The x-axis is the distance. So the separation between x1 and x2 at the surface. And the y-axis is this time lag. So t in this function here. Well, what's going on? Um, let's focus on this first ridge. So the ridge at lowest time line. If you look at how waves propagate in the, um, in the solar interior, a wave that you launch near the surface heading downwards, it's refracted as, the, as it travels down because the sound speed is increasing as you go into the interior. And that wave turns around and you see it at X2. And this path here, we talk about a ray path that connects X1 and X2. And as you move X1 and X2 further apart, this ray path gets longer. And that's why as you increase the distance along the X axis here, the time lag where you see a signal in the cross covariance increases. And the, the reason you see that you see this, this feature in the cross covariance is um, you have a wave that shakes the surface at X1. It reflects off the surface, goes down into the interior, and you see it again at the surface at X2. And so that connects these two Doppler signals. It means that they're correlated. Um, and then you have a next ridge and that comes from the wave that bounces once off the surface between X1 and X2. Um, I'll show a little bit more about that in the next slide. This arrival up here is an interesting one. This is something that you see when X1 coincides with X2. And you see a signal after a time delay of about four hours. This is the wave that bounces straight off the backside of the sun, the surface at the far side of the sun. I'll show it. It's, um, 
is a little more clear here. So now we're looking at a cut and we're seeing some ray paths. And on the left is again, the time distance diagram. And these numbers on the right correspond to different places along ray paths on the left. So for example, this two prime signal is the wave you see at point A. It travels almost through the middle of the sun and comes back to a point not so far away from A. That's the two prime signal. The one one prime is the one we talked about before. These are the single skips. And this red curve here comes from double skips down here. So waves that bounce once off the surface in between. Okay, so that's a cross covariance. Well, what can you get about what can you learn from the cross covariance? So the, the really interesting thing is that the cross covariance depends on local flows. And here's an example. So imagine we have some points X1 and X2, and we measure this cross covariance between them. Blue is what you get if there's no flow at all. And red is what happens if you put in, this is a, a quite a strong flow, a kilometers per second flow between one and two. And the cross covariance changes to this red curve. And what you're seeing is that for the downstream waves, so those are the waves in this geometry that have a positive time lag, the waves that are traveling downstream, the cross covariance shifts to earlier time lags. For the waves going in the opposite direction, correlation shifts to larger time lags. Um, and so by measuring the cross covariance, you can measure something about these wave travel times and those tell you about what's going on in the interior. Um, I don't wanna get into it in too much detail, um, but there are different fitting methods you can use to extract these changes in the cross covariance. Um, people sometimes they talk about phase times and what they're talking about are shifts in the fine structure of the wave packet, group times or changes in the envelope of the wave packet, the amplitude, just the height of the wave of the, of the envelope or the mean frequency. And these parameters tell you something about what's going on in the interior. I think it's, it's worth pointing out here, and I think it's interesting that if you sit down and look at the numbers, you realize it's not possible to compute or store all of the possible cross covariances. So for example, if you think about HMI observations, so we're thinking about 4K by 4K images, and you work out how many possible cross covariances there are, you find a really disturbing large number. It's, you just can't do it. Um, and so you have to think about averaging. And lots of people have, have thought of lots of different ways. Um, and they're, they're typically motivated by, by intuition. Um, you can think about ray path geometries and, and averaging based on that. Um, there's in holography, data are averaged using Green's functions. And, and here you're thinking about focusing. But it's, I think, fair to say it's still an open question about what the optimal way to do this. Um, and when we see some example measurements in the next lecture, we'll come back to this topic a little bit. So I wanted to say a little bit more about geometry. Here's an example. Um, so imagine you choose some point that you're interested in on the solar surface, and you imagine putting this little template onto your Doppler map. This little circle in the middle, I'll call the center, and this surrounding thing I'll call the annulus. If you measure travel times from the center to the annulus, you measure travel times from the annulus to the center, you get some a travel time that tells you about the horizontal divergence of the flow in the region around that center point. And then you can move this template around and for each point where you place the template, you can measure a travel time. 
And this map shows some example. Um, the dominant thing you see is the supergranulation pattern. This black and white pattern is, is coming from supergranules. So this is a, an intermediate scale of convection. But there are lots of other possibilities. You can measure travel times from the center point to this west quadrant and the west quadrant to the center point and the center point to the east quadrant and the east quadrant to the center point. And you can pile those all up in a way that gives you um, a signal proportional to east-west flows. And that's what this next column is about. So these are measurements that are sensitive to east-west flows. And you can do the same thing with the north and the south quadrants. Again, averaging travel times together with the right signs. So you get something that's proportional to north-south flows. I wanted to show an example and, and explain a little bit more. Every once in a while when I give a seminar talk or a conference talk, something like that, someone comes up to me afterwards and says, you know, Aaron, your, your talk was mm, interesting, but what were those colorful boxes that you were showing in your talk? They, so I thought I would try to explain uh, what those colorful boxes are about. Um, Here's an example. So we're looking at a map. This is a little portion of the solar surface. And the color in the background is about, is showing you the horizontal divergence that we're measuring from this center to annulus um, kind of measurement. So for each particular X and Y, imagine putting that little template onto your Doppler gram and measuring travel times. Um, and if you think about what a horizontally diverging flow means, it means because of stratification, you must have an upflow. I mean, something has to be supplying that, um, that outflow to make mass conservation work. And blue means downflows. And just by scaling the east-west and the north-south travel times, you can make an estimate of the horizontal flow at each particular location. So again, imagine moving those little quadrants around and measuring something proportional to the north, the, the east-west component of the flow and something proportional to the north-south component of the flow. And based on that, you can put a little arrow on the map. Um, and just for fun, there's also a magnetic field shown on this image. And again, what you're looking at is the supergranulation pattern. These red features are where you have supergranules. So upflows and outflows. Here's a nice one. Here's one. And the magnetic field tends to be in the regions where you have blue. So where you have horizontally converging flows. Okay. So Next, next up, uh, ring diagram analysis. So the, the beginning of the procedure is tracking a small patch and the, the jargon that gets used here is a tile. So tracking a small patch of the surface as it ro rotates across the disk. And then we're gonna do some data analysis on this, this little tile's worth of data. So let's call the Doppler data D the first step is to appetize this. So A is, is some function that's zero outside of our tile and it's one in the middle of the tile and it smoothly isolates, isolates the data in the tile because we're about to do a Fourier transform and we don't want any sharp edges. And then you compute the local power spectrum. Here I'm using the same notation D tilde for the appetized data and I've just replaced X by kx and y by ky to, and omega here instead of t to show that we've taken Fourier transforms in those three dimensions. And I'll show some, show some examples. But the point really to remember is that this local power spectrum is, is sensitive to local physical conditions. You can think about it as a way to, to measure the local dispersion relation of the waves. Here's an example. 
So this thing, remember this power spectrum, this local power spectrum is a three-dimensional thing and you can make figures by cutting it in different ways. Here's an example. This is a, on the left, there's a cut at constant frequency. The rings that you see correspond to the different modes. At fixed frequency, the outermost ring is due to the F mode and then the P1 and then the P2 and so on. Another way to look at the same thing is instead of making a cut at constant omega, you can make a cut at the constant amplitude of K. So here phi, this is the angle associated with the horizontal wave vector. The norm of K is fixed and the Y axis is the frequency. And if we had no flow, each of these ridges would be straight. The dispersion relation would be isotropic. But once you put a flow in, you get a Doppler shift and that's what's written here. And this Doppler shift and this kind of cut shows up as the sinusoidal form of the ridges. And in the left here, it shows up um, these as shifts in these um, ring positions. And, and this is what's measured with, with ring diagram analysis. Um, you fit the positions of the ridges and you infer parameters that have to do with the local physical conditions. The, I don't wanna get into the details too much of how the fitting is actually done, um, but I just wanna say sort of what the, the top level point is. Um, you know, we want to measure some parameters that tell you about the, the horizontal flow averaged over across that tile where we've made a ring diagram. And you can measure these flow parameters for different radial orders. Um, for example, for the F mode, for the P1 and P2 and so on, and for different horizontal wave numbers. Um, the fits are typically done one radial order at a time. Um, some fitting methods use cuts at constant frequency, others use cuts at constant wave number. So the two examples that I showed on the previous slide. Um, there has been work done with fitting more than one ridge at a time because you always worry that the tails of some ridges are underneath others. And so they're not purely non-interacting. Um, but the point is that, that the end result of this fitting process is that you have some set of flow parameters, UX and UY that depend on the radial order and the horizontal wave number. And those flow parameters describe the average flow felt by that particular mode. And so now it's starting to sound like what we talked about in global helioseismology, that we're going to use measurements for a whole bunch of different modes um, and knowing that different modes are sensitive to different parts of the interior to figure out what the flow looks like as a function of depth. But before we get to that, I, I wanted to show a, a figure just to make the whole thing a little more concrete, at least I hope more concrete. So what I've talked about so far in the ring diagram analysis is what you do with a single tile. But of course you can make these measurements from many, many tiles. And here's an example. Let's just stick with the top left one. Um, so everywhere you make a little, you can put a ring tile and you can measure a horizontal flow. And so you put a little arrow on this map telling you about the horizontal flow at each particular horizontal location. And that way you can build up a picture of what the flow field on the sun looks like. This particular example is about flows around active regions. That color scale in the background shows the line of sight field. And notice the scale here is quite a bit larger than what I showed for, the, for that time distance example. These are degrees. So this map is, is covering, you know, 60 degrees on a side. It's a quite a big chunk of the, 
the solar disk. Um, and this is a Whopper, Whopper active region. And I've skipped ahead a little bit here. I'm showing flows for different depths, but I haven't really explained how the inversions work yet. Um, but we'll, we'll get there in a minute. But the point is that using ring diagrams, you can make maps like this that tell you about horizontal flows on the sun. And you can make maps at different depths. And this particular result is interesting. Near the surface, the depths are written over here on the right. Um, near the surface, you see these flows are going towards the active region and you go quite a bit deeper and you see flows going in the other direction. Um, so interesting things are, uh, are happening in depth. Okay. Um, I wanted also to say a little bit about inversions. So this is all about inferring physical conditions in the interior from helioseismic measurements. And we talked about this a little bit before um, in the last lecture. The first step in setting up an inversion is defining a forward problem. So that is given some model for the solar interior predict helioseismic measurements. And in the best case, we can make a linear forward problem because this lets us do linear inverse problems and that's a whole lot easier. And in some cases, that's linear forward problems are very good approximation. Um, and there are a lot of different approaches to, to forward problems in local helioseismology. An approach that's commonly used for ring diagrams is essentially analogy with global modes. So you take the rotation kernels from global modes and you use those to interpret the ring diagram measurements. There's also ray theory and this is, is basically formalizing this picture of, of ray paths. And you say that wave travel times are affected by, for example, integrals of the velocity um, along the ray path. And we know it's not, it's not quite right, but it's, it's certainly because the waves that we do with have finite wavelength, but it's a very intuitive approach. And, and I think it's really good for thinking about interpreting observations at a, at a more qualitative level. Um, another approach is the Born approximation. So this you'll all remember from your quantum mechanics courses. This is a single scattering approximation. I don't wanna talk about 1D or 2D inversions again, because these are essentially analogous to the inversions for global helioseismology that we talked about last time. Um, but just to say, ring inversions are typically done, are, are typically 1D. They're depth inversions, one tile at a time. And then you make maps over, over horizontal position just by plotting the results from different tiles. Um, an example where 2D inversions show up in local helioseismology are inversions for the meridional circulation as a function of radius and latitude. 3D inversions though, that's a different topic. That takes some thinking. Um, so if you try to just write down a 3D inversion thinking, okay, I'm just gonna do the way it's done for, for global helioseismology, you quickly realize that this is just not computationally feasible. You end up with a matrix that you have to invert. It's just much too big. And there, there are a few things that you can do. Um, and a reason, uh, I, I should have said that the reason this matrix is so big is because you have so many measurements. You have, for example, maybe um, measurements um, of east, west, and north, south velocities for a whole bunch of different positions on the surface and for a whole bunch of different travel distances. Um, and then if you just count these up, you realize it's not going to fit in your computer. Um, and there are a few things you can do. One approach is, is to use an iterative solver. 
where you never actually have to form this enormous matrix, but you only ever have to compute the action of the matrix on a vector. Um, and that's one way to go. But there's a, an important special case. And that is when the uh, kernels are translation invariant. And what that means in terms of physics is that you don't care where on the surface of the sun your measurement is made, it has the same sensitivity to local flows. So you can just move the whole problem over. And in this case, and I'll, I'll show this in a qualitative sense, in a qualitative way in, in the next slide, you can take this 3D inversion problem and you can decompose it into many, many small inversion problems, one for each horizontal wave vector. Yes, so yeah, I wanted to, I wanted to motivate that a little bit. So you can write some general linear forward problem for local helioseismic measurements. Um, let's say our measurements are di, so these could be whatever travel times or ring parameters, whatever we have. Um, and they depend on, again, some kernels, just like in the global helioseismology case. And these are things that only depend on your, on your reference model and on the details of what your measurement process is. And some delta Q, these are the perturbations to the reference model. So for example, flows or changes in the sound speed. And you have some net effect that comes from adding up all of these different effects, the contributions from all the different delta Q. And this is very, this is a general linear forward problem. Um, and we can look at some of those kernel functions. I don't wanna get into it in too much detail. This is a calculation for the sensitivity of P1 travel times. Um, so these are travel times that are just measured by, by isolating the P1 modes. And you can look at how those travel times depend on local flows. This function here, K is a vector because you have in general, you have a vector value flow in the interior. And you can look at each one of those guys. And on the left, you see the sensitivity of a travel time between these two black points due to a flow in the X direction. And this looks more complicated than it really is. Um, all it's really saying is that if you put positive Vx in here, your travel time goes down. Okay, the wave goes more quickly downstream. And you get some complicated finite wavelength effects giving you a sensitivity of say an east-west travel time to a north-south flow. Um, but I don't wanna get into the details for today. because the, really the only reason I wanted to show that is so we could talk about this multi-channel deconvolution. And the point is that when you have this translation invariance, you can make a, write a simpler version of the forward problem. So now instead of saying for every possible measurement, I have a new kernel, you say for my measurement at point X, all you have to do is shift your kernel function over there. So now instead of X prime, we have X prime minus X in the argument of the kernel. And once you do that, you realize, okay, now I can rewrite this thing in the horizontal Fourier domain. So if you look at one particular Fourier component of the data, it depends on only one particular Fourier component of the model. Um, and then you're in business. You've split your inversion problem and you can solve many little problems instead of one big problem, and that's a lot easier. I wanted to show an example. This is an inversion to determine horizontal flows just beneath the surface. And you've got a big old sunspot in the middle. You see a flow diverging away from the spot. This is the moat flow. Over here, a little bit to the west, you have this beautiful supergranule. This is a diverging flow near the surface. And you can see that it's cleared out the magnetic field around it. Um, 
here's another example. It's not quite as pretty. Here's another one. Um, and so this is an example of the kind of map you can get by inverting measured travel times. Yeah, so summary and, and outlook here. Um, the outlook, I should say, is contained entirely in next time. Let's check out some results. But for summary, um, we can use local helioseismology to measure flows in three dimensions. Um, the input data is, is typically time series of Dopplergrams. Um, time distance helioseismology is about measuring the time for waves to go from one place on the surface to another. And the thing to keep in mind there is that yes, they're going from one place on the surface to another, but they do that by going through the interior. And so by measuring these wave, wave travel times, we're capturing something about what's happening underneath the surface. Um, ring diagram, helioseismology, you can think of as measuring the local dispersion relation of the waves. And again, this is something that's sensitive to what's happening underneath the surface. Um, and then there's the idea of inversions. This is about going from sets of measurements travel times or ring diagram parameters to models of the interior. And we'll do the results next time. And that's what I wanted to say for today. So thank you everyone.